for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajani. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor-activist Christopher Lawford and author Sven Krongeier. Actor, author, activist, Christopher Lawford was born and raised in Santa Monica to British-born actor Peter Lawford and John F. Kennedy's sister Patricia. When they divorced, Chris became an East Coast kid living at 990 Fifth Avenue and attending St. David's School, Tufts University, and Georgetown. He also graduated from Boston College of Law. Pretty lofty world, the Kennedys, <laughs> political notoriety, law, the Hollywood Rat Pack. When did you realize your life was so privileged? I don't know. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I think uh, probably not, you know, and I write about this in my book, Symptoms of Withdrawal, when, when I was eight years old, my uncle, President Kennedy, died. And, that was sort of the beginning of a, a time for me where I realized that there was a lot of attention being paid to my family. Before that, I didn't have any idea. In Santa Monica, it was nothing? No, in Santa Monica. You must Monica, have had I celebrities uh, coming and going. Yeah, I grew up in a, well, we grew up, I grew up in this house down on, on uh, Sorrento Beach that was built by uh, Louis B. Mayer, actually, one of the great moguls of Hollywood. And uh, we lived there. And, you know, I mean, my parents had, you know, they, they, they had a great sort of social, uh, uh, ambiance in that house. We'd have, you know, Frank Sinatra was my, my a good friend of my, both my dad and my mom until he ceased to become a good friend of both my dad and my mom. <laughs> and he was also my sister Victoria's godfather. And I had sort of godfather envy from a really young age because he would come, uh, you know, every couple of months with great presents for my, for my four-year-old daughter. But, you know, Milton Berle was there, Judy Garland was there. I mean, people, you know, Marilyn Monroe was at our house a lot. I mean, there was a lot of, but to me they were just old people who were friends of my parents. Old people at that time, right? Yeah. Your Twice. grandfather, talking about old people, your grandfather Joe said experienced shapes a person, experience shapes a person. Did you find that to be true? The experiences that you've had? I think, um, I think that that's true. Uh, there's a lot of things that shape a person. Uh, my, my grandfather was a, was a strong believer in experience, and he he uh, he infused our family with this sort of uh, uh, belief that the more that you live life and the more that you experience life, the better it is for you as a as a human being. The fuller you become, and I think that that's true. But with a work ethic, right? Wasn't he very much very strong worth ethic? Yeah, he had uh, a you know my my grandfather was self-made. Mm -hmm. um, he made all of his money. You know, he he w he had a resume that was really incredible, um, and uh, and you know did a lot of things in finance. Was in the movie business. Was you know ambassador to the court of St. James. Ran the, you know was chairman of the SEC. Was political. I mean, he my grandfather had enormous energy, an enormous will, an enormous accomplishment, and uh, he believed that everybody. Uh, should, should do that. Should be yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, the only person who could really keep up with him was your grandmother Rose, that you, whom you loved. I mean, from the book, you right. had a very close relationship with her. Right. My grandmother was, I think, um, I mean, as as much as my grandfather believed that experience shapes a human being, my grandmother believed, I think, that in the spiritual uh, yes, side that's... of things. And I, I think that uh, you know, today my life, and certainly that my, the trajectory of my life has been one of sort of. I mean, I, I experience a lot, and I also have a great appreciation for the spiritual side. She was very instrumental, I guess. Probably she was always in the back of your mind as you were writing the book and going through the experiences of the book. It seemed to me like I always felt uh, Grandmother Rose was there. 
rather than grandmother Lawford. Well, that's, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. My 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 mother's uh, my my father's mother, uh, Lady Lawford, was uh, somebody who I don't remember, who I don't even remember meeting. And uh -huh. she, but I, I I know that I would have enjoyed her a lot. I think she was uh, she was an incredibly uh, colorful character, probably. A bit of an alcoholic. Oh, was or she? A bit of, was she a eccentric? A bit of a crazy person. Yeah, yeah she very was very eccentric, eccentric and very uh, not a not not a good mother to have. She drove my father crazy. <laughs> I remember, but probably I would have enjoyed her as a grandmother. Um, but my grandmother Rose was entirely different. She was really a a woman who uh, loved her grandchildren and also was was very much. I think of all the people that I grew up with. Um, was the most present as an as an adult. You know, some pe adults mm. you can tell whether they're present with kids or not. Kids yeah. can really know. And and she was somebody who, when you spent time with her, you really felt you had her attention. Well, in Symptoms of Withdrawal, your book, you read about all of this. I mean, I I had such a wonderful read going through it. And one of the things that it said was the family credo was us, the Kennedys, against them. And you were always taught to st stay close to your family and stick up for your family, right? Well, I think that that's a credo that um, I grew up with that was certainly part of my parents' generation, uh -huh. my mother's generation. Uh -huh. well, with us, I think we had that to some degree, but there was a little bit more infighting with our generation. Because uh -huh. there, there was, we had, you know, I grew up with 29 cousins and we all had our, we all had our, um, agendas so we, we we mixed it up a little well bit there more. were more I guess the family got bigger yeah, and bigger absolutely uh, you had to go through your uncle Bobby's and your uncle Jack's assassination you address that a little bit how was that as a kid because you were a child actually well you know I wrote this book uh, not really I mean this book tell is is a lot about my family but it's also about my it's really my journey it's a memoir. It's I wrote it to establish a career as a writer. I didn't write oh. it as a book to reveal where I came from necessarily. I mean, a lot of this book um, is about you know people that will like this symptoms of withdrawal if they want they're interested in reading about the Kennedys or they're interested in reading about Hollywood to some degree. But it it really is a book about. Um, self-realization and self-discovery. I mean, I most people, and one of the great gifts of writing this book is that um, I wrote about my experience in terms of becoming who I am, not where I come from. So the book is about recovery, really. A lot and of you it, see yeah. the day by day. Um, did you feel embarrassed to reveal the way you were living your experiences? Because no. you had to write them, yeah. no? Right, no. No, it's interesting. It's a very honest book, and mm -hmm. people, um, I heard from one of my relatives who, who will remain nameless um, that the, I actually threw another person that this person had read my book and thought it was wonderful and had said to one of my cousins, oh, I read Chris's book. And, he, and my cousin said, I don't think I could ever uh, reveal the kind of, you know, be as revealing publicly as he was, as I was. And I, and I, but I don't, I've always lived my life that way. I don't have a, uh, I don't have a real governor on terms of what I choose to talk about or choose not to talk about. I like, I mean, I, I like exploring the truth, no matter how, and it doesn't embarrass me. Well, there was a lot of things that would have embarrassed other people. That was one of the questions I was thinking about. Weren't you embarrassed to have to reveal that you actually acted like this or that you were going no. through these situations. Isn't that no. great that you yeah. would feel like that? Well, only because I think, <coughs> first of all, I want to be really clear that this book is stri is about me. I mean, I and one of the things that obviously when you write a book like this, when you come from a famous family, people go, well, you're going to reveal stuff about right. other people. I think my, the greatest compliment I got was from people who know me and know members of my family, and they said that I walked that line where I didn't I didn't violate my any of my family's, uh, 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 you know, uh, trust in terms trust. of there was a turning point after 20 years and um, is that what stopped you uh, or started you why were well you I think addicted? what you what, what you said in terms of revealing stuff I think you know people ask me today whether or not I could change where I can come from or it could change oh, the yeah. past would I do it and I tell them no because all of the stuff that I went through and that's in this book in terms of my drug addiction, my recovery, and all of that kind of stuff is instrumental to who I am as a human being. And so un unless you go on that journey, you're not going to get to the, 
to where you might be today. And it's still a journey. It's, it's we're here, you know, the, the whole life is a journey. But today you can feel more accomplished because you're a writer. You're, right. you're doing active uh, work for drug addiction. Right. You're yeah, right. acting in movies. So you, you came to a point. What I couldn't re figure out was how you remembered all those incidents <laughs> if you were so, so in another says. world. That's what everybody says, and this, especially after James Frey, they're all like, how did you remember all this? I know. One of the great gifts of this, first of all, is one of the benefits that I had that most people don't have in terms of writing a memoir is there's been a lot of stuff written about me and my life oh. that I had as a resource. Oh, you know that's what I good. Mean? Because people have written books about my life that I actually had never read before I wrote my own book. Oh, that's interesting. That, that re reminded me of oh. the way it was. So you some got degree. some So little... I got, oh, I got a lot of stuff from, from, from the stuff that had already come before. And my mother saved every piece of stuff that I've ever done in my life. Every report card, every essay, every oh, letter. So that She helped. saved everything. So I had these files and I saved everything. Did she save it for your sisters too? So yeah, she, she saved had files, her kids. She had files for <laughs> each one of her kids. She would just take everything and she just throw it in the file and that was So that helped a lot. Yeah, it helped a lot. So that was your research. Did yeah, you I had did that. you talk to your cousins? Did you talk to no. people who were no I didn't talk did to you anybody. talk to I talked to Milt Evans who was my father's manager. Uh -huh. Who was great guy and a great resource. And I talked to Irma Lee Riley, who actually took care of my dad and took care of us when we were kids for a little while, and she was helpful. But my, my, family, my family didn't like this from the get-go, didn't understand it, didn't want anything really to do with it. I think that really, like, I'm reading along and it goes, I had a really great drug dealer in Boston. <laughs> I mean, you know, that kind of right, thing. Right. It's like, yeah. what kind of drugs were you on? All different kinds yeah, of drugs. Yeah, every every kind of drug you can imagine. I mean, I you know I think. Weren't I've, you I've afraid? Said, no, uh, never. You know, alcoholics and addicts aren't afraid of dying or aren't afraid of any of that stuff. Anything. That's not. Life is scary. Mm -hmm. Life on life's terms is scary, but 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 what you take isn't that scary. Well, let's talk about that because you're working with the Karen Treatment Center, right, right. Uh, which I think is so fabulous. Well, one of the gifts of this book that I didn't anticipate at all was what, was what came back in terms of the work that I've been able to do with different organizations and public speaking and helping people kind of get it. Th this is an enormous problem, a, a, an enormous problem in our society. A, Continuing? I, well, no, addiction. That's I what mean, I mean, it yeah, continues? It's, oh, it's, 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 it's enormous. I mean, in the, in the criminal justice system, in the workplace, in the d domestic abuse issues, um, all of these oh, kinds. Yeah. It's, a, it's identified by, by the federal government as the number one public health issue in America. And in terms of cost, in, and in terms of lives, in ter you know, so it's, but people have a very difficult time dealing with it because most, most people think, just don't do it. Just say no. Nancy Reagan, just say no. It, it's, it's not that simple. Does it ever go through your mind, just say no, when you're addicted? Oh, absolutely. Listen, I, I know this disease better than I know anything. I've been sober for 20 years, and when I'm confronted with somebody who can't stop, uh -huh. I'm like, just say, you know, just stop. And I, you, you know, do e say yeah, that? Even, there's a part of me that does because uh -huh. I have that same instinct. Yeah. Because it's so frustrating. It's so difficult. But it's, but it's a chronic disease that you never get cured from. It's like hepatitis or diabetes oh, or hypertension. It's those, those kinds of things that you just manage. So you're working um, at it all the time. You're always, you're always in remission or, and you're oh, in compliance. Oh, yeah. And the compliance rates, quite frankly, for addicts and alcoholics are better than they are for other diseases. People don't understand that. People think that it's you know that it's one of these diseases that you just you can't you can't really get a get a hold on, and that's just not true. But you you can control it, like you say. That's you that's what you say. It. You can manage you can, it. And you can stay sober it. a day at a time. And I, I you know I work with people like Karen, uh, which is a treatment center in Pennsylvania that does good work there. There's lots of people that do good work all over the country. Are there a lot of those kind of treatment centers like Karen? There are. There's, I mean, there's, you know, Betty Ford in California. Oh, the there's same they, type yeah, of thing? Right. I see. And they do, you know, they do. And, and then there's, you know, plenty of organizations that offer help to people that are not inpatient places, you know, that are, that are you know, Alcoholics Anonymous is one that they, you know, there's, there's plenty of places that people can go for help. Talking about that, your father actually, I guess, was an alcoholic. When he lived in the Sierra Towers, you tell funny stories about going up and actually either doing drugs or drinking with your dad. So he, it wasn't a help to you. 
as well, a Well, my as dad, a we, grew up, we grew up in, you know, my father grew up in a time in Hollywood in the 70s where a lot of people were, was, were doing this kind of thing, you know, and the, well, the people ask me why I, why I started using drugs and alcohol, and I tell them that in 1969 it was a totally different society. I mean, as a matter of fact, it was kind of expected that you tried this stuff. Mm -hmm. And many people, it was complete, socially completely acceptable to do drugs. And it was also acceptable on some level to do drugs intergenerationally. And my dad and oh, I did that, oh, yeah, and, and we did that to some degree, and it was it was not helpful to either one of us. Um, that that's not what I do today with my kids. No, um, I would say I wouldn't <laughs> think you would. We've come a long way. We've come a long way in understanding what 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 is appropriate f between father and, and son in terms of this kind of behavior. But, but that's a, a wonderful point to stop on, because you do you you are a role model for your kids now, and a role model for so many other people. Well, I don't know about that. But well, I do you, have, do. you do. I, I mean, do, by just yeah. talking about right. it. I do work, and I've been there, and I, my experience is, you know, one of the th great things that I've learned is my experience, the worst of my experience has been helpful to other people, and that's a great thing. Well, symptoms of withdrawal, very interesting, and thanks so much, Christopher Lawford. Thank you, Joan. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Sheriff author Sven Krongeier. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Author Sven Krongeier served in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve and is a 17-year veteran of the LA, Sheriff, L.A. County Sheriff's Department. He's written articles for law enforcement uh, publications. And what I was wondering, Sven, was did these articles lead to writing your book, Six Guns, uh, Six Guns Sound? Well, it did give me uh, some good practice with writing, but the, <laughs> the actual uh, impetus for the book was uh, was working on a master's degree thesis. Oh. And uh, it started from there and grew into a book from there. Well, is there um, uh, a crossover between the sheriff's department and the police department? Why do we need a sheriff's department? Because I think that's what you explain in your book. I sure do. The uh, Every county must have a sheriff's department, mm -hmm. and that's uh, per statute. And the county sheriff's department came in 1850 when California was formed, and that comes uh, before the police department. LAPD was formed around 1875, and the oh. county sheriff came in 1850 with the founding of the state. Oh, it did. Yes. And that, and and why did you get so interested in the history of it? Well, uh, it was one of those things that just kind of snowballed on me. <laughs> I started doing some research and it, Where did you it. research? Where did you research? I did research uh, all over Southern California, uh, mostly at the Huntington Library in San Marino. Oh, yes. really? Mm -hmm. Why do they have such an uh, archive? They have a wonderful collection of the early historical manuscripts, uh, often written uh, on parchment with ink paper from the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. Mm -hmm. And they have the original manuscripts there that I used to help me write the book. Did you talk to any old timers who related stories to you? I did, but most of the folks from my era had long since passed on. What uh, is this era? So what, what time, 1850 time to 1900 is the first 50 oh. years of the Sheriff's Department's history. This really isn't just about the Sheriff's Department. When I started reading, I found it was a fascinating um, survey of early Los Angeles, the history of Los Angeles. Was that really as wild west as in the 1800s as, as you said it was? It was wilder. It, uh, <laughs> it was it really wilder. Was, it, was, it was a very dangerous town. Los Angeles had uh, 12 streets and 2,000 people and there was at least a killing almost every single night. It Is that right? Very, very dangerous town. So who wanted to start the department? Uh, well, the first person was uh, Sheriff George Burl that ran for office in oh, 1850. Uh -huh. He was elected uh, with a few hundred votes. Mm -hmm. And did departments all across the United States start this way? Did they look to yes. LA, uh, LA, I guess to LA, right? <laughs> LA County. Did they look to California? Uh, no, there was a pretty much uh, well established routine for uh, uh, establishing a sheriff's department. So when a new county was founded, there were certain oh. rules. Officers had to be elected. The Board of Supervisors had to be elected, a treasurer, all these positions. Uh, and one of the positions was the Office of Sheriff. So that always came into play every time a county was founded? Exactly. And yet we founded it here, you said. It was like the first Sheriff's Department? 
uh, for in 1850 when the state of California was formed, oh, for the all the counties in the state elected sheriffs. And that's when we elected our sheriff. Yeah, for well, sure. I think this is a really interesting book, especially to sheriffs. I was in San Diego and I was telling the, uh, the, the sheriff down there that you had written a book and I sent it to him oh, because he was like so interested, I think, because they're writing something or they continue to write these departments? They do. There seems to be kind of a resurgence right now of law enforcement history. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, unfortunately, many departments just do a lot of picture books and yeah. captions, and uh, it's not really thoroughly researched. So I kind of wanted to change that and do a, a, an actual book, a, a well-researched book on our history. Yeah, there was a little bit more meat to it. Was the corruption at that time as bad as the corruption is now, a hundred years later? You know, traditionally, West Coast law enforcement has been, uh, the officers had been pretty well paid. Uh, sheriff Burl, the first sheriff, was making, in today's money, over $200,000 a year. So wow. uh, they really didn't have a problem with corruption. Um, sure, occasionally there was, and, and there continues to be, sadly. But uh, for the most part, uh, here on the West Coast, we avoided a lot of the corruption that they had on the East Coast. What about uh, within the cities, the, the county that the sheriffs rule over, was the crime the same as it is today? Pretty much so. The uh, crime uh, is, uh, the murder rate has dropped dramatically, uh, but uh, overall crime has um, been pretty consistent over the years. Um, and uh, again, the murder rate was the, the real problem back then. It was just a lot of men and very few women in town, and a lot of drinking and gambling. So, Was it also because of the ethnic mix of the settlers? Because there was, so, there was such a great mix. I mean, we have a great mix of, of uh, citizens today. But it seemed a little stranger then because they were coming in without any knowledge of, of English. Do they have to? Uh, it was get tough. Along? How was it to get along? <laughs> <laughs> There's always been racial tension uh, here in Los Angeles when the Latino community uh, found that they were having to deal, uh, lose their power structure when the Anglo community started to move in. And a lot of those Anglos were from the South and they had a sense of southern pride, southern oh, honor. I see. And so not only would they fight uh, amongst themselves, but there would be racial conflict uh, between the Latino community and the Anglo community. So. Well, we had those, those uh, minorities fighting, but did they also become a part of the sheriff's department? They <laughs> sure did from early on. In fact, Sheriff Tomas Sanchez was the first Latino sheriff, and he was elected um, uh, throughout the whole Civil War years. Oh, way back, is that right? All the way, yes, through the Civil War. So he was, early on, there was a Latino sheriff. Mm -hmm. And then when did women come into the service? The women came into service early on as matrons to help with uh, jail maintenance and female prisoners. Oh, so they were, in the, they were in the mix? They were in the mix from early on. They would serve temporarily. Uh, but the first females to actually go to patrol was much later in the 1970s. And how did that did integrate? Um, what kind of percentages do women um, I currently play? couldn't tell you. Uh, that wasn't the focus of my research. No, because it's now. We're talking <laughs> but, about now. But in, yes. in the time of your book, mm -hmm. was it only matrons? Pretty much only matrons, yes. yes. What about um, the criminal element? Are they as dangerous? We talked about sadly crime, so, but are they yes. as dangerous? T sadly so. Today, uh, there's just as much, uh, just as dangerous uh, banditos back then as there are today. Uh, that really hasn't changed much. And and sheriffs killed in the line of duty. Does that happen a lot? It used to in the early years uh, because the sheriff was the hands-on law enforcement person. Oh. He actually went out and would arrest people. Today, there's. Uh, over 16,000 employees, as many as 8,000 sworn deputy sheriffs, and the sheriff today has a different role than he did back then. Oh, He's more so of a manager and a politician today. Well, talking about politician, has the sheriff gone on to be the mayor of a city or the governor of a, of a state? Has that happened? That has happened where sheriffs in the past uh, jumped roles, especially in the early times. Did they, it? Some of them actually became uh, chiefs of police. Oh, they switched over? Uh, they switched from sheriff to chief of police and back and forth um, to those types of jobs. And some of them did pursue political careers, um, uh, uh, some of the deputies as mayor or city council members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you don't hear too much of that from the sheriff's department. You hear the police chief right. want, ha pursuing political ambitions and, 
and I hadn't heard that with the Sheriff's Department. Um, why did you join? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I was uh, just out of college looking for work and I had a friend who was in the military with me that joined the department and said, hey, take a look at it. And, uh, and I did and uh, it's been great. I've never looked back. And do you help recruit people? I will if someone uh, professes an interest in law enforcement and they want to talk about it. I'd love to talk to them about it. It's been a wonderful 17 years for me and uh, I'm looking to the rest of it. Do you go? Do you, do you have to go to any law enforcement classes along the way? Yes. Sure do. You start uh, with the six month academy, the Sheriff's oh. Academy that you have to go through training and then uh, you serve some time working in the jails. Uh, oh, you do? Sure, do. every deputy must do that. And from there, you go to patrol and learn how to work uh, on the streets. And what are some of the things, encounters that you come across? That I've come you, across? You, yes. Personally? <laughs> uh, well, actually, I very, was very fortunate to work uh, in Malibu Lost Hills for seven years and got to see many movie stars and, oh, uh, nice. and uh, you know, respond to calls for service for them. Uh, and it was an exciting time. Yeah. Six gun, six gun sound. Tell me what that means. It's, uh, I guess if you closed my, I, I wondered what it would be like to be back in Los Angeles in the 1850s and I, I thought if I closed my eyes and I could envision what it would be like, what would I hear? And I would probably hear the sound of six guns uh, going off. So, Is that right? Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> was the impetus for the, uh, the title, yes. So um, what do we have? The early history of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and Sheriff Lee Baca wrote the foreword. Sure you have did. some really interesting things in there and I thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017. We'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. So I have two books.